everyone, and welcome to another episode of Annual Pass. This is the podcast where we talk about all things theme parks, attractions, shows, snacks, food, anything having to do with theme park and theme park related contents we talk about here on Annual Pass. I'm your host, Jack Patillo, and of course, joining me, as always, is my beautiful and talented co-host, Jeff Ramsey. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, Jack. How are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. How are you having a good day? I'm having a great day. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty nice. Good, have, better days. We have a fun episode planned today, Jeff. We are going to be talking to Dave Cobb, who was the creative director over on the Men in Black ride at Universal. He's been an engineer. like He's not an Imagineer, because that's specifically Disney, but he's been working in the theme park kind of world for a long time. And I'm very, very excited to talk to this guy. That is exciting. That's um, I feel like that's one of the rides that when we were there, you were the most reverential about. Yeah, like you, yeah, really, yeah. you really dig that it's, ride. It's a, I had a lot of fun on it. It's a fantastic yeah. ride. It's, it's a lot of fun to go on, and uh, it's really cool. It's it's kind of an older ride at this point, but it's been around for a long time because it is so good. Well, and it's not only that, but I find that uh, the good rides that stick around longer. They do so because they're charming as all hell, right? And that I, I feel yeah. like the Men in Black ride is, is uh, it fits the bill. I mean, I love the Men in Black ride because it has all the animatronics. And yeah. it's like you don't get to see that as often as you'd like to. And Absolutely. this thing is chock full of them. Yeah. So, uh, but no, Dave is a guy that when I first was starting up Annual Pass, um, he, I, I, I just started just binging all kinds of other podcasts, including there's one called Theme Park Stop, which I love. It's just a great podcast. And uh, he did an interview with them kind of talking about, you know, Men in Black. And the interview was fantastic. And I started following him on Twitter. And I was like, hey, man, I've got this, you know, this thing coming out. Like, we're doing this new show. Because we only had, like, maybe one or two episodes up at that point. And he's like, oh, yeah, like, let's talk. And I'm like, okay. So him and I just, like, like just Skyped one day. And just talked for, like, an hour about theme park stuff. He's like, oh, yeah, like, let's, let's talk sometime in the future, like, for an episode. And I was like, okay. And I'm like, well... You just did this one for theme park stop. Let's give you some some room because I right, don't want to step little, on little, toes. Yes. And also let, let, let me kind of get this under my feet and then we'll get you on. And so was, we got we got him on today. Was he the first person you reached out to when uh, we think, started this podcast? I think so. He, yeah. he may have been like the very first kind of like guest that I'm like, this would be he would be cool to have on the show. And then obviously we've had other guests. I got really lucky with Ken Marino. Like that was kind of one of those things, sort of a moonshot, and it worked. Yeah. And so, uh, and now I've been I've been reaching out, I've been so like subtly reaching out to James Gunn because uh, you know he's got lots of cool stuff in the theme parks. He's the director of Guardians of the Galaxy. He also did you know Mission Breakout in California, and uh, he's he's actually responded a couple of times on Twitter. And then I have a friend who's actually closer in touch with them, and he's like, I'm so busy right now. Like it sounds cool, but I'm so busy yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, he's yeah, shooting sure. Guardians three, so I'm like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bug him anymore. He's trying to wrangle Pratt right now. Yeah. I'm sure that's not easy. So I'm like, nope, you know what? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna harass him but like, hey, when it pops up, I'm like, hey, by the way, we'd love to have you on. So anyway, James Gunn, if you're if you happen to listen to this in the future, we we'll know you. you're listening. <laughs> uh, don't forget to check out all of our awesome merchandise at store.roosterteeth.com. We got some cool shirts. We've got our 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 poster up there now. We've got our holiday pin, which I love. And I've been so I'm going to Disney very soon, and I'm trying to uh, get our merch team to just send me like 20 of them so I can just seed them to all mm. the pin traders. Just like start you know trading our pins <laughs> for theirs, and so like they might be out in the wild. If you get down to like the 11th hour and you haven't been able to acquire those pins, let me know. I'll give you mine, and you can. <laughs> No, no, I can no. always I can always get another no, one later. No, you keep yours. I, well, I I mean I have I'll, I'll get a different one. I'll get another one okay, eventually. Okay. But if you're like if you know if you're the one I have, the I, clock, gave, I gave to my nephew, so he has my yeah. original. So I I don't I don't even have one right. You now. You don't even have one? No. I don't. I, do you have one? Can I have yours? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You can have mine. <laughs> So, uh, and also don't forget to follow us on social media. Uh, we are annual underscore pass on uh, Twitter and Instagram. I almost forgot what our socials were. But then you didn't. I didn't. You I, saved I, it. I, Nobody I, would have been the wiser had you not. But I'm being honest. Us. I don't want to lie yeah. to the pass holders. They're, they're an amazing that. community, and I love talking to them. But uh, let's not take too much time because we have we have Dave waiting for us, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to talk to him about all things men in black and theme park related in general. He seems like a cool guy. Do you think it'll be nice to me? I, I hope so. Uh, I me hope too. So. Okay, you, you deserve it. So huh. without further ado, here is our interview with Dave Cobb. Jeff, I am very, very excited to introduce to you Mr. Dave Cobb. Dave, welcome to Annual Pass. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for having Absolutely. me. Thanks for Absolutely. I'm, I'm psyched to have you on. You were actually one of the first people I reached out to when I started Annual Pass. Got six months ago at this point. And because uh, yeah, yeah. you would just you did an interview with Theme Park Stop, which is one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. And uh, immediately I was like, oh, I would love to talk to you more about, you know, like everything you've worked on and kind of how you got into the industry. Then I'm like, let me let me get some episodes under my belt before we uh, before we bring you on, because I figure <laughs> you're, you're a pretty high, high profile guest, done a lot of really cool stuff. I want to make sure, you know, we're not, you know, some fly by night podcast. We've actually got 
got some stuff. And so, Jeff, I think we've made it now. I think we're we're to the point where we can have Dave on. To oh, talk about it's cool today things. the day. <laughs> today is the day. <laughs> Looks exciting. like we made it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dave, I guess sort of the, the big thing for me that kind of drew me to uh, your work was you worked on one of my favorite attractions of all time. You, I mean, you were the, the the man behind it. You did Men in Black Alien Attack at Universal Studios Orlando. And yeah. I, I love, love, love that attraction. And oh, uh, I know... Thanks. Uh, Je- Jeff, that was one of the first things we brought you on. Jeff went to Universal Studios for yeah. the first time ever this year, and uh, he he enjoyed that one too. Yeah, he's he's a rookie, Dave. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm a theme park newbie. Yeah, <laughs> one of us, one of us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about kind of your involvement with that ride? I mean, were you there from the very beginning? Were you brought in? How how, how did you get involved with Men in Black? So. Um, well, I, I had been uh, I had been working in sort of nascent uh, positions within the themed entertainment industry. I mean, I'll, I'll back up even farther because there's a bit of a precursor to how mm-hmm. I got there, which is um, I was actually a tour guide at Universal Studios in Hollywood for a while. I sat on the trams, gave the tours. Um, that was my first job out of high school during college. I was going to film school, thought I wanted to work in movies, um, was a, a writer and, and that kind of thing. And sort of fell out of love with movies. Plus there was a big, a couple of big writer strikes and sort of the industry really, really slowed down. And so I found myself, uh, I dropped out of school cause I just wasn't interested in film production anymore and sort of toiling at the tour as like a day job, trying to figure out what I wanted to do and screenwriting and stuff. And a job fell into my lap via the job posting board at universal studios, which was um, working for a division called planning and development, which is now known as universal creative. And it was, um, Entry level job, um, a, a, a production coordinator on what ended up being Back to the Future: The Ride in, at Universal Hollywood, the second installation of it. And so I learned attraction development from opening day to you know nothing on paper to opening day, really, really fast in a in an entry level role. But Universal at that time was very like the Wild West, and they and they <laughs> and, they, and, they, and it really was. It wasn't you know silly Comcast money like it is now. And so it, it, they really <laughs> let people. They really uh, helped uh, people grow. And so I had a lot of sort of mentors on that project who said, hey, you're really good at this. You should stick to this industry. And so I did. And so I ended up doing some show writing for Universal. I worked for a company called Landmark for a number of years and did a couple of big things for them, like the the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas and 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 um, worked on really early drafts of like T2 3D and Spider-Man at, at Iowa and stuff, because those were a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, Disney and Universal don't do it all themselves. They hire other companies to help them develop these things. And so I worked, I got to work on a lot of little things. It's like a junior, like, show writer, right? Okay. So while I'm doing this, um, I, uh, what's also happening at the same time, because this is a big part of the story of how Men in Black fell in my lap, was I'd also come out uh, of the closet, for the listeners who don't know what that means. And so <laughs> I... I uh, 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 I was singing with the Gay Men's Chorus of L.A., which is sort okay. of a creative outlet I had outside of work. And one of the people there that I knew got to know really well over the four or five years that I sang in the chorus and helped produce shows for them because they did spectacle shows. They did big foam puppet numbers for Christmas and stuff. It was crazy. Um, one of the guys in charge of all that was a guy named Phil Hedema, which is a name you may have heard of. Mm. Um, Phil at the time was the uh, president or vice president of um, attraction development at universal creative. And so he got to know me. He knew I worked in the industry for somebody else, but I got to know him personally and got to know him through these creative outlets of, of the stuff that wasn't work. Right. And a curious thing happened. He called me up, um, in 1997, I think. (laughs) Okay. And, and he said, uh, let's go to lunch. So we go to lunch and he's, and he sort of spells out what's going on, which he's like, you know the industry is really busy right now, right? And and if you think about it, in 1996, 97, you had Tokyo Disney Sea under under development. You had mm. California Adventure. You had Animal Kingdom. You had Hong Kong Disneyland. You had Islands of Adventure. Right? This was a the, the golden era of 90s theme parks oh, was yeah. happening right then. And because of that, the industry was really strapped. There were a lot of people. Everybody was working. Right. Mm. So they were scrambling for new talent. And he said, and here's my problem. Islands of Adventure is slated to open in middle of early to mid 1999. And the analysts have told us that we need another e-ticket attraction 
at the studio park next door a year later so we don't siphon our own attendance. But this was like end of summer 97 at this point. Clock is ticking and they hadn't done anything. Oh, wow. And so they're like, we really need to fast track something, right? And he said, and I need a creative director for it. And I don't know. I, there's nobody I can hire. And he says, I don't want to make it sound like I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel because I'm not. I think, <laughs> I think this is the right. I, he actually said that, which was very sweet. But he said, you know, I think it's time for you to step up for this. I think you're the guy that can do this. And so, you know, he, he, I signed the NDA and, and, and opened the kimono and said, here it is. And it was Men in Black. Wow. And that, that movie had just, that was like, this was like October 97, I think. Mm -hmm. So it was still in theaters and still a massive hit. And so my brain just went, uh, yeah, where do I sign? <laughs> I mean, what, what am that, I going to say? No. Right. Yeah, and no, no. When they brought it to you, how far along, like had, had, had someone dropped out or was it just kind of in concept phase at that point? Their concept guys had done a little bit of work. Um, one of the guys that had worked on it a little bit became my boss later at Thinkwell, uh, Craig Hanna. Um, he was at universal and I met him there. Um, so because it was a fast track project, I mean, let me, the, let me give the big picture of this. Mm -hmm. We went from nothing on paper to opening day in 28 months. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that, that is wild. And this, that's unheard of this in is, this business. This at this point is the first ride you've creative directed. Um, I had worked on other rides as a show writer. I had okay. creative directed some small projects. Um, one that I'm very proud of that we used to be in Vegas called the uh, M and M Academy. It's where the M and M's go to get their M. And it was this little three. <laughs> ah. It was this little three D movie. I don't think it's there anymore, but it was really adorable and charming. Um, I so I had done I'd done like some show programming on things at Star Trek and 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 this thing called Caesar's Magical Empire that used to run uh, all the stuff that I did at Landmark. I worked on T two a little bit just on on the writing for the pre show, but like. I hadn't been in charge, right? I'd worked yeah. with other creative directors and the things I was in charge of were really, really tiny little projects. And so it really was and, pushing me into the pool, you know, like, oh, wow. go, here you go. Here's <laughs> kind of here's, trial, trial by fire. Not only yeah. is this, uh, are, is it, are we at the 11th hour, but it's also a major property. Here's, here's $80 million, dollars. have fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> The fact is, it's one of the oldest standing attractions still at Universal right now says a lot. I mean, that's got to feel pretty good at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been open 21 years and, and, and you know, I had big plans to go there for the 20th anniversary last year. Womp womp. That didn't happen. Yeah. But I ended up getting my my um, my vaccine two weeks before uh, my two, uh, I got my second vaccine two weeks before um, the 21st anniversary. So I ended up like booking a last minute ticket and going. And, uh, -oh. uh, and I went drinking, drinking around the park because the park attraction's 21 now. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I drank and, and I, and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more of this story later, but there's like a, a, there's a fan club on Facebook that, that follows me and follows my Twitter and stuff. And they're called the MIB 900 club. And they are people who can, <laughs> there are people who can score like nine, 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 nine. They can max uh, it out, which wow. I can't, I can't even do to be honest. Yeah, I'm, so, I've gotten close to that, <laughs> like nowhere near that. Um, they were like, hey, we saw you were going to be there. Can we can we have a meetup? And I'm like, sure. So on the birthday, there were like, I don't know, 100, 150 people there. And there's like three or four thousand people in this fan club. It's kind of great. Oh, and wow. it's and it was all people who are, you know, uh, pass holders and families that this is the first and last ride they ride every day. And it's just it was it was so lovely. And, you know, people taking pictures and asking me questions and stuff. But beyond that, it's it's just what a ride becomes to people after 21 years is not something we plan for and not something yeah. I, I really could, it could predict or expect. And, and like any, and I mean, anybody who works in any creative industry will say this, the big thing, when you finish a creative work, it's not yours anymore, right? It belongs yeah. to the audience that day really sort of solidified, right? This is something that they own. This is all theirs. And, and to yeah. me, that's, that's the amazing thing of, of an attraction being open that long is it's not just, um, the physical attraction, it's this sort of emotional space that it that it represents for people in their day to day life, you know? Yeah, it's got to feel great, too. Yeah. And, and kind of humbling, honestly, because oh, yeah. here are here's this community of thousands of people that, you know, there are probably friendships that have formed and people oh, that are a part of yeah. each other's lives purely because they all found the commonality of the love of that ride. I That's a uh, God, that's kind of that's got to. It's got to be a very warm feeling to have. Yeah, it's it's super humbling. It's super like, you know, I, I didn't 
obviously getting into this industry, I liked it because of the physicality of it and the sort of it's mm-hmm. like theater plus architecture plus, you know, cinematic storytelling. But like the, the, at the end of the day, you know, I say this all the time in like talks that I do and that the most important story in a theme park is the story the guests have to tell about it. Right. This is a this is if we've learned anything from user created culture in the last 25 years is that our audience as theme park creators, our audience has an audience and that audience is going to be heard. And so that you were trying to create these experiences that people want to talk about or people want to write fan fiction about, or people want to record their scores and give tips to people online. Like that's crazy that that happens. And it's, and it's so gratifying. Um, my favorite thing that day, in addition to just, I told everybody we're going to ride it once and then you're going to go drinking with me for two or three hours around the park. And then we're going to ride it again after about five cocktails. Um, so, uh, in addition to doing that, like, you know, I met up with people and there's this one, one mom came up to me and she brings her son over. I think his name was Hunter. He was like seven maybe. And she's like, he is tall enough finally today to ride, to ride your ride. Oh, Oh, that's great. I said, Hunter, you and I are riding together. And she like got (laughs) giddy, you know, got all teary (laughs) and giddy. And so I sat next to him and she took all these photos of me riding with him. And it's like, I'm not a celebrity people. I'm one of you. I'm a big old nerd. I love this stuff as much as you do. So, so to sort of see that happen for a family. And she told me, she's like with their older kids, this is the thing they want to do when they walk in the park. And it's the thing they want to do before they leave and they record their scores and they get competitive with each other. And it's like, wow, I, you know, obviously an interactive ride, we knew there would be rewritability, but there's this this aspect of it that now has transcended the function of the ride. And it becomes this, it has a club on Facebook. It's got people that literally do fan art and fan fiction and all that (laughs) stuff. You can't, you can't predict any of that stuff. And that's an alchemy that I don't know if I'll ever figure out why or how. That's so great. I love that kind of stuff. It's it's the stories that you never expected that, that pop up that that's always the best kind of stuff where it's like, like you said, as a creator, you make one thing and it's like, you hope the audience takes it in the direction you want. And then they kind of run with it and make it their own thing. And that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's Man. beautiful. It's it's absolutely beautiful and it's very humbling and it was very moving. I teared up a couple of times that day. It's really, it's nice, you know, and it's not just, and I also, you know, I also had uh, a couple of the people that still work at Universal, my friends who worked on the attraction. There's some people that are still there and still catching up with them and seeing what they've been doing for the past 21 years. It was a really great day, you know, but y- you would ask me like w- how much of it had been done before I came aboard. And that's yeah, yeah. kind of fascinating as well, which is um, very little. Um, they had done a couple, they had done some concepts. Because it was a fast track project, they knew this couldn't be what we lovingly call in the industry a science experiment. <laughs> meaning, meaning we weren't going to invent a new ride system. Mm. We weren't going to make up some new thing that had never been tested before. It had to be put together with known components and known commodities in terms of special effects and ride vehicle and, and size and capacity. And so we had a capacity goal. We had a um, we had a. Uh, an age demographic, right? We knew the movie was sort of all ages. Um, we had a, um, a, and then we had a budget, right? So you had that. And you also had a plot of land and the plot of land where it sits now, um, fun fact, that was originally going to be tr- the Jurassic Park ride before it was oh. put over in Iowa. Um, okay. Um, there are renderings of that out in the, in the world if you want to look. Um, okay. But so we had a couple of components. Um, and then the other thing we had was a roster of ride vehicles. They, they were, exi- you know, Universal doesn't necessarily like to use off the ride, off the shelf ride vehicles, mm-hmm. like stuff that other people make, but they had developed a few of their own, namely next door at Iowa that were yeah. becoming proven and in, proven in, engineering that they knew would work. And they said, look at those. And so the first one we tried for the longest time, not really long, a couple of, couple of months was, you know, the sexiest one was Spider-Man. Right. The scoop, right? Yeah, it's got to be it. The, the scoop, like the motion yeah. based on a track. Oh, my God. Wouldn't that be great? Turned it into the fo- turned it into the Ford POS and, uh, uh, <laughs> and and, and you know, go on a shooting spree <laughs> until you realize that motion bases and shooting rides. Yeah, do not go together. You get like, your arms out while they're whipping around. That's you're going to be yeah, smacking and, each other. Yeah, smacking each other in the face and you can't aim at anything. I mean, that and the thing about that ride vehicle, that ride vehicle is about perspective about view view shed is what we call it like it's got those very protected sides you you see exactly where they want you to see and that's the the magic trick of spider-man if you've ever seen off-ride videos or walk the track is like 
holy crap, why does this work at all? Well, it works because <laughs> you're only seeing what they're showing you. Yeah. And, 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 and so that didn't lend itself to open world, find targets and shoot it either. And so why would we spend, cause that ride vehicle is not cheap. And so why, <laughs> why would we spend that? We even did a test where I, we took, um, we bought a bunch of laser tag kits from the toy store and set it up in Spider-Man. And this is still <laughs> before it opened. Right. Oh, and, that's so and, cool. And, and like, we were like, this is, this is dumb. This is never going to work. <laughs> you know, it's a hundred million dollar attraction. You threw laser tag kits on it. Like that's, that's so great. Yeah. I love that. I mean, the side note is we all knew Spider-Man was going to be amazing and it hadn't opened to the public yet. Um, I got a, uh, you've probably heard the name Scott Trowbridge, who is now in charge of all things Star Wars at Disney. He was, he was the guy behind that ride. And so we were friends when I worked there and he knew I was working next door. And one night, one night I'm working late over at Men in Black and I get this radio call. He's like, come to, come to Spider-Man right now. So I get in the golf cart and I zoom over and it's the first time anybody other than the team has ridden it. And, wow. and it was black and white film. It was test prints. It wasn't even the final. It was not final music mix. And it was still the best ride I'd ever been on. It was wow. mind blowing how well that magic trick works. Oh man, it's a, it's such a good, it's, a, it's such a great ride. And then honestly, for me, Transformers, they just took it to the next level. Like I, I love Transformers might be one of my favorite attractions ever. I, yeah, I love super fun. How, how they took, you know, what they had and just amped it up. To the, it, it's so great. So yeah. let's take a short little break so I can tell you about our sponsor on today's annual pass. I'm excited for this one. It is The Matrix Resurrections. The Matrix Resurrections is a continuation of the story of the first Matrix film starring Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss reunited as Neo and Trinity. Do you know Neo is an anagram for one? I don't think that's a spoiler. That's, that's pretty old. It's an unexpected expansion of their story that ventures back into the Matrix and even further down the rabbit hole. And in this mind-bending new adventure, the world is more provocative, reality is more subjective than ever, but all you need to see the truth is to free your mind. It's just that easy. And the Matrix Resurrections return to a world of two realities. One, everyday life. The other, what lies behind it. Ooh, spooky. To truly know himself, to find out if his reality is a physical or mental construct, Neo will have to choose to follow the White Rabbit once again. I bet he chooses to follow it. I don't know. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I'm going to assume it, he probably does. And if he's learned anything, it's that choice, while an illusion, is still the only way out of or into the Matrix little twist there. Neo already knows what he has to do, but what he doesn't know is that the Matrix is stronger, more secure, and more dangerous than ever before. Deja vu. Mm. <laughs> Watch The Matrix Resurrections in theater and on HBO Max at the link in the description on December 22nd. Go check it out. I'm very, very pumped for this one. It's Lana Wachowski, and I, I can't wait to see this amazing film. Everything I've seen of all the trailers. I haven't seen the movie yet. But all the I've seen the trailers, and I'm very, very excited for it. And seeing seeing Neo and Trinity back together again? Come on. How cool is that? That's very awesome. So check it out. Coming out December 22nd, HBO Max, if you don't want to go to theaters. Or you can go to theaters. Either way, very, very cool. Love it. I'm very excited to have them as a sponsor. So that's going to do it. Uh, thank you very much again for sponsoring this. And thank you for listening. And, you know, not, not skipping past the uh, little, little ad read. It's a good one. It's a good one. You should check it out. With that being said, let's get back to annual pass. I'm I'm fascinated that you you've made it all the way here. You started as a as a backlot tour guy, which is honestly like <laughs> that's one of my favorite things ever. Because when I when I worked, I worked at Disney MGM back in the day, and I worked at the backlot tour. I did the water tank portion of the backlot tour, and just I had a blast doing that, and just. I mean, you know, in, in Florida, it's a little different because it's not an actual true back lot. They, get, they fake it and stuff. So but every time I would go to, you know, Universal Hollywood, I love taking the back lot tour. You know, it's the three hour long ride. Yeah. But I was fascinated because, like, I remember going as a kid and seeing, like, the bones from Jurassic Park, the Lost World and, like, yeah. you know, seeing the crash, the crashed airline from War of the Worlds. And I mean, yeah. the, I mean, the whole Back to the Future, you know, like areas is incredible and yeah. even seeing stuff like you know the water crossing that i'm like this is from history of the world this is where mel yeah. brooks was standing there and 
I, I love that stuff. And it is it is so cool because I, I've, I've heard other stories of people who worked in the back lot who went on to do stuff within Universal. So, yeah, I guess yeah. it, that, that's the way to do it, huh? Just get a job out in Hollywood. <laughs> well, and, I, you know, I, you'll be designing I, rides in the next week. It'll be great. No time. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I do tell, uh, you know, we've got a lot more university programs and training programs um, that lead into our industry now than when I started. There's tons of them now. Mm -hmm. Um and whenever I meet these kids and they ask me, like, you know, how to get in the industry, one of the things I say is if you, you know, an internship at the design company is something you need to look at in college, but also go work in a park. Like working mm -hmm. at a park is the best education I ever got in how to design them. Um, yeah. How, there's, a, there's dozens of Imagineers who were Jungle Crew skippers. There's another perfect example. And mm -hmm. it's, because of, it's because of a couple things. On one hand, you see how audiences respond to things. You see what people enjoy. You see what they talk. You hear what they talk about. Um, you see what breaks down, you see what works and what doesn't work. Right. Um, and then from a, from a professional standpoint, sitting on a tram and talking to people, the thing people might not know about the tram, the, the tram tour is yes, it's scripted, but it's also not on rails. The tram mm -hmm. has to reroute based on production or whatever. So I learned a, a manual, the size of the LA phone book <laughs> and, and, and would only actually use a third of it for any tour. And so you're, you're always sort of, you know, uh, uh, sort of making up stuff as you go along. There's a lot of vamping, but you had to make it feel seamless. And so you become this enthusiastic storyteller, which absolutely 1000% fueled my ability to pitch something in a room to clients. And yep. so, so I learned to talk, I learned to pitch, I learned to sort of, you know, talk the talk and walk the walk and sound like I know what the hell I'm talking about, even if I'm <laughs> making up as I go along, fake it till you make it. I learned all of that. Um, as a guide. And, uh, uh, and so my gift of gab from that is actually what, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, what got me all the writing gigs and got me the creative directing gig for Men in Black, because I could talk about the industry, talk about um, how I saw that story of Men in Black, what, what was important in it, right? I sort of pitched mm -hmm. um, Phil a couple of ideas right at that lunch. And, uh, and I was like, y y you know, like the number one thing was, and they had already landed on this too, but this is before I saw any of their, their work. I said, you know, the number one thing about men in black is wish fulfillment. You, you absolutely have to put that suit on. You absolutely mm. have to zap at aliens at the very least in this attraction yeah. or else you fail. And he's like, yep, that's what, that's what we want to do. You, you nailed it. <laughs> the more people that we talk to in this industry, which is fascinating to me that have uh, starts in the industry, similar to, to Dave and what he's describing, you know, Gregory Hall, we talked to recently had a similar oh, kind of cool. start. The more obvious it is to me, that you didn't follow that path, Jack. What do you think the difference between their <laughs> success and how you ended up in life is? Do you think it was that you didn't try or? I don't, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that, Dave, because like you talked about like how really kind of like it, it got kind of gets you over a fear of talking in front of people and being able to yeah. speak quickly and coherently. I worked in 2002. I was a 20 year old kid and I worked at the Great Movie Ride, which a Great Movie Ride was like a 50 page script. It was 22 minutes over and yeah. over with 70 people. And those people are all looking at you and it's like you better give them a good show because they paid a whole lot of money to take them and their family <laughs> to this park and i took that to heart I, I i very much bought into the you know the disney life of like you know this is an experience you're a cast member these are guests and and i i mean i bought into it because i remember going as a kid and not how much i appreciated that and how it felt special and so when i was there as a cast member i was like okay like there are going to be people here that are really you know they want to have a good experience and have a good time with it and so i took it very much to heart and I got over the the fear of speaking in front of people. I got I got over that that nervousness. And he realized like, no, just you know, if you mess something up, just roll with it because no one's gonna pick up on it except for you and maybe some of the people you're working with. Right. And, I, and 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 honestly, and that's that's where I got over my my fear of doing things. I mean, like we Jeff and I we we tour around the country doing live shows to you know sold out theaters of two thousand people and like. If you would have told me that when I was in high school, I would have peed myself. But I mean, now it's like, oh, yeah, it's a blast. And getting that energy and that feedback, it's it's such it's such a special thing. And it's it's kind of neat how, like, you know, everyone can kind of take that and run with it in different directions. And, you know, yeah, yeah. I ended up I ended up here and somehow because Jeff gave me a chance <laughs> <laughs> to be to be fair, Jack, you do still pee in front of people. It's just it's 2000 people you pee in front of now. <laughs> But it's it's such a remarkable thing, and it is it is so cool. Like I, I love seeing that you've kind of come, you've worked your way up through through this, you know, the, literally from you know just a cast member working at the at the the backlot tour. Did you yeah. did you do any other attractions, or were you like backlot tour right off the bat, or did you start at like the animal actor stage and then ended <laughs> up there? No, I, I started out as a guide. I knew oh, wow. when I when I graduated high school, 
Um, my dad's like, you gotta get, gotta get a summer job. I'm like, <laughs> I, so I had, I had gone to the, t I grew up, a, a, I could ride my bike to universal, right? Oh, like wow. that's how wow. far away it was, wow. but it was not a big theme park when I was a kid. It was the mm. tour, right? It was just yeah, the yeah. tour and the mm. stunt show and, and all the animations on the tour, like the, the, the rock slide, which became Battlestar Galactica and, and then King Kong in 86 and earthquake in 89. And so like, as a kid, they, they had the, the, the annual pass back then, by the way, it was called the celebrity annual pass. And it was really Ooh. just for the, to get in the tour and the entertainment center. It was like 15 bucks back in the seventies oh, wow. and eighties. And so I got it almost every summer from about 12 years old on and, and would just go ride the tram over and over and over again, because I thought, Oh, this is how movies are made. And I wanted to get into movie making. Right. And so it was fueling this passion for movie making, which ended up going in a different direction, but it's still storytelling. It's still leveraging what I knew about, about film. Um, but like, uh, I mean, the, the, I bet to this day, you can also re recite any of that script like that, right? Uh, a few parts of it. it it's it, like for what it's worth, the 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 version I did was 2002, as opposed to like the final version before they shut it down had radically changed. Like TCM right, ended right. up taking it over, and like right, it was a lot right. more automated. Which, right. in my opinion, like it was like all right. And it's funny because doing this podcast, um, I even went back. We did an episode on Confrontation, and oh, I cool. forgot there was a tour guide on Confrontation. They actually you had a live cast member on the ride with you, and yeah, I had and, forgotten yeah. all about that. And it was like, yeah. oh man, like that would have been great. And because. It feels like like the 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 guided tour is so few and far between now. You've got you know you've got Jungle Cruise and Backlot tours, obviously, but yeah. I mean other than that, it's not really you know you don't get that interaction with the audience as much anymore in, in theme parks. Is and one of my favorite things, one of my favorite attractions, is the the horror makeup show. At, oh yeah, uh, at Universal. Yeah, yeah. I took Jeff to it the last time we were there, just because they're interacting directly with the audience and it's like, you yeah. don't and they have that back and forth and you just don't get that very often anymore. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I, this, you know the. Uh, the, uh, if you haven't talked to him, another guy you should talk to is Michael Ayello. Mm -hmm. He he was a Ghostbuster in the park, and he was a Blues Brother in the park in Florida, and now he's the chief guy behind all of Halloween Horror Nights. Oh wow! So I know, oh, yeah, wow. people have recommended him. It's he's we actually great. we talked with uh, Scott Porter, who has oh, gone yeah. on to do Lucifer and a whole bunch of other things. But he was actually he worked at the the Graveyard Review. He was at the Beetlejuice Graveyard Review, and he was also yeah. he got cross trained a whole bunch of different stuff, including being a Ghostbuster, yeah. which is yeah, yeah, so yeah. cool. Yeah, well, you'll have, have to put us in touch with all these people. I, I we this is, this is like slowly become my favorite episodes to do, just talking to people because I'm fascinated by people's backstories and how they ended up where they were. And yeah. and, and funny, like so, Jeff mentioned we talked with Gregory Hall. Him, uh, you and him have something in common in the fact that you both pitched Steven Spielberg, which to <laughs> me is is absolutely like that would that'd be the the scariest thing I would have ever done in my life. Oh and, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, you went you went to real depth on it in the theme park stop episode. So if you if you haven't listened to that, go listen to that because he's really into it. But if you just briefly talk about what it's like sure. being in a room with Steven Spielberg, sure. Well, I I, I mean I I did pee a little, just a just a little. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, so if people don't know, Steven Spielberg is like the executive creative guy. Universal has a deal with him that they get to say he's the executive creative director of their parks. And it really means that at a certain point in everything's development, they sort of have a meeting with them and pitch with them. And so we were at a certain point in development for Men in Black, and so, which means we had a we had a track plan. I had a bunch of really cool sketches of all the alien gags. I had a couple of maquettes. You know, I had the ride vehicle design and the and the guns design. Nothing built yet, but it's like um, Phil knocks on my door in my office and says, uh, "By the way, you have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, are you sitting down?" <laughs> And he and I said, yeah, and he says, uh, this is the Steven meeting because he knew he told me before it was going to be coming. And I'm like, OK, he's like, so here's the deal. I, I if you I, I will be there, but this is your meeting. And I'm guys, I'm 28 Ugh. at this point. And so this, went behind this the is ears. like Jurassic Park era, Steven Spielberg, Schindler's List, Steven Spielberg. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Yeah. And the meeting was at Amblin, by the way, like oh. we literally went to the Amblin offices, the Adobe offices. They let me in the conference room to set up and there's like an original E.T. in the corner. And and, the, and you know, the little uh, 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 the, the idol from uh, Indiana Jones hanging on the wall. And oh, wow. like, I'm just like, oh, my God, my childhood is literally <laughs> adorning all of these walls. So um, they, I, the assistant comes in and says, all right, Steven's got 30 minutes with you and that's it. And I'm like, great. I've rehearsed this. Uh, I can do this, this entire pitch in 15 minutes, leaving us 15 minutes for questions. Um, he comes in and the first thing you notice is, first of all, he's, you know, anybody of that stature has a presence when he walks in. Very handsome, real fit, you know, comes in super big smile on his face. Nice to meet you. 
And the first thing you notice is he is laser focused on you and it is about you and you are on. And it's not a, in a, that sounds like it's pressure, but it's not what the, the vibe you get from him is you're a peer, you're a creative person. Tell me why you're a creative person. Tell me what you're doing. And so it's very comfortable. It was, it, he's instantly comfortable to talk to. And that 30 minutes, by the way, he kept waving off his assistant again and <laughs> again and again and again. We had over 90 minutes together. We had wow. three, t- because he was so into it. Because he kept asking questions about individual gags and, and then, oh, what are the multiple endings going to be? And, you know, and Phil warned me about it ahead of time. He's like, so have a pen and paper. Steven's going to have a lot of expensive ideas. Just not, <laughs> just nod and smile and write them all down. Right. Nice. <laughs> and so Man. I do. So I do. And, and, and some of the ideas he had were like, oh yeah, that's another $80 million ride. You, that's a, you just doubled the price of this ride. Um, but, but a lot of it was just little funny gags and tweaks and things that were uh, what the brand was about and what the, the things he loved in the movie or things about the story that he thought we weren't, you know, he's a story guy. So he's, yeah. you, you don't, you, you listen to every comment and every suggestion Steven Spielberg gives you because even if they're too expensive, there's a lot in there that you're going to cull through. And so Phil told me, we will look at this list together and then we'll have a phone call with him a week later and say, here's the two or three we're going to implement. How's that? Right. And that's how this works. Okay. He says, Rhett lather and repeat. This is what we do with Steven on every attraction. And so 90 minutes later, I felt like I, I, I felt like, I felt like it got greenlit is the best way to, <laughs> the best way I can say it. Like I, we were already going to happen. It wasn't not going to be built, but it was like, oh my God, I literally, uh, trust me, the, the gravity of that situation was not lost on my 20 year old brain. <laughs> and I, re- I told friends for years after I'm like, I could die happy now. That is a, <laughs> that is a career right there. I'm good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's definitely um, one of those guys. Like I, I, I would, I've never panicked around people. I'm pretty good talking with people, but the, the three people in my life that I've, I've seen and just like kind of locked up around was Steven Spielberg at an E3 one year. I saw he walked by and he was with his kids and I was just like, I froze. And then I very, I through a weird set of circumstances. I got a tour of South park studios and Trey Parker oh, cool. and Matt stone. Uh, both of those guys are like my heroes, like creative geniuses. And so like, see, and I saw, but I was literally like uh, arms reach away from both of them and it was just incredible. And so that's, you know, they, I'm, they, I'm, they, I'm very envious of you, but they, you know, they tell you, you know, you, um, you never forget how somebody made you feel regardless mm-hmm. of what they said. You never mm-hmm. forget how they made you feel. And the lesson I got from that is this is the most, if ostensibly the most powerful man in Hollywood who does not have to be nice to me. Yeah, he does not yeah. have to even extend three times past the time he allotted for me. He does not need to sit patiently and listen to me while I explain to him things about his movie that he probably already knows, right? <laughs> like none of that n- has to happen, but it happened. And so wow. what I, I, I will never forget that as a 28 year old, nothing, he made me feel like a peer. He made me feel like I'm one of him. You know what I mean? Wow. Uh, it was incredibly moving afterwards. I sort of had a, a little nice long breakdown cry afterwards. Like, <laughs> I can't believe I did that. Like, I can't believe I accomplished that. But more importantly, it's just set me on this mindset now that when I deal with younger talent, people coming up through the industry or people asking for, for advice, like I, I learned that the most important thing is not what you say but it's how you say it. And, and I am an open book and I'm a, I, 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 anybody who follows me on, on any of the socials knows this. I am an open book for people who want to get into this industry. Just DM me like, fine, we, we'll, we'll, I'll set up a zoom. We'll talk. Like I have no problem talking to people about this stuff because I love it. And so that's, that was the, the takeaway was not, here's all the expensive stuff that Steven told us to do. The takeaway was, holy crap. That is one of the most, um, uh, 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 validating creative meetings I've ever had in my life. And I'm doing this right. And it probably, it probably shapes the way you, uh, approach all creative meetings and, and working with people for the rest of your life. I, yeah. I would imagine. I mean, yeah. what a great, what a great mentoring moment that I, oh, yeah. I wonder if he was even cognizant of, you know? No. Sure and and was. I mean, I'm sure he does. I mean, everybody that works with him probably has, experiences like that and there's people who've been you get experiences like that every day and there's experiences that like mine that were just one-offs i'm I'm never probably never gonna meet him again you know um (laughs) 
but yeah, it's, I mean, the other big thing I'll, I will say, the other thing that, 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 uh, sort of informed how I approach creative meetings and things is we talked about working at the tour and, and being able to pitch because I can sort of sit and tell a story. The other part of that was one of the things I did while I was at the tour is uh, to, to sort of flex my writing muscles. I did a lot. I was in a lot of improv classes. Um, okay. oh. I, I did, I did improv at a couple of different places around, around LA, not didn't perform a lot. It was mostly classes, but you know, if anybody that's ever taken improv, improv is not about being funny. Improv is not about talking. Improv is not about coming up with punchlines. Improv is about listening. Mm-hmm. Improv is about, about being present in the moment. You know, everybody, mm-hmm. everybody who's ever done improv knows that it's, it's yes. And you never say mm-hmm. no, you never reject anything. You, you accept and heighten everything that anyone has ever given to you uh, on stage. And so that colored my, my creative world as well, that I, I, you know, there's no, so no, uh, <laughs> as we used to say, think, well, there's no bad ideas except the bad ones. So just keep them coming. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 interesting because, you know, when Jeff and I mean, Jeff's been doing he's been working for Rooster Teeth for 400 years now. But when we started Achievement Hunter, <laughs> Thank you. yes, it, it was so much. It's you know, the stuff we do is we're, we're playing video games with each other and people like, oh, you just play video games for a living. It's like, yes, but that's just one of so many things we're doing all at the same time. Like the for, for me, setting up a joke for someone else is my favorite thing to do, like not not hitting that punchline, but like basically like teeing it up for someone to knock it out of the park is just a, is a blast. And that's so. Oh, yeah. So important for that kind of stuff. And it's like, that's all that all comes into play in you know, in, yeah. in pitching and in life in general. And man, that's, that's awesome. I, I, I hope I never get to, or I mean, I'd love to pitch Steven Spielberg. I don't know what I would ever pitch him on, but at this <laughs> point, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and the other truth of the matter is it, it's not like I was someone going in asking him for money to make a movie, right? Let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is a, this is a, this is the gravy part of his job. This is the fun <laughs> part where he's just a consultant. He's paid a bunch of money from universal to come in and look at this stuff. Not that he, he doesn't have any uh, care or, or passion for it. He uh, just it, on the contrary is nothing but passion for it. Yeah. But, but as far as my presence there, it's like, Oh, here's this new guy from universal who's come up with this cool idea. Let me listen to him. Like yeah, that. Yeah. It, it was, uh, it's, it was, you know, like I said, it was 90 minutes, but it felt like five. It went by like <laughs> that. And you know, well, I figured too. It's also, you know, that's that's one of his babies. You know, it feels like Steven Spielberg took over like half of Universal Studios back in the day in some form or fashion. Because you know, yeah. you you had Jaws, you had Men in Black, you had he was he involved with uh, Back to the Future? I think he had it. Like, was he a producer he, he, on it? He was a producer on Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah. You, then he Back to the Future, E. T. Like he had that whole ring over there. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's got to be that's got to be pretty awesome to walk in, you know, being yeah. like, oh yeah, here's all of my babies in in yeah. physical here's form. Here's your entire childhood. In- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's yeah. that's great now you you did mention at one point too you were part of the gay men's chorus of los angeles yeah i've got to ask you so uh that that triggered a memory for me were you involved with the shia labeouf song with rob cantor because he uh, used that he used the the choir yeah no 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 that's after i left oh, I, I, that, okay. was, that was great i loved that bit yeah. that was really good they get hired all the time to sing to things <laughs> for, they've sung on movie soundtracks and and it's a, it's, it's an amazing organization. I mean, I always tell people like, you know, just as a young gay man coming out in that environment was instantly 120 men of every shape, size, creed, color, orientation, representation, presentation you could think of. And so it was like, oh, wow, this isn't being queer is not what I've seen in movies (laughs) or on TV. (laughs) It is these 170 different souls around me that, that are instantly brothers and mentors and friends and 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 so it, it was a it was an incredible artistic experience, but it was a personal experience that was quite formative for me. Oh, that that's beautiful. Yeah. So sorry, I just I I that, that triggered the name and I double checked. I'm like, oh, that's absolutely like. So if you haven't seen uh, Shia LaBeouf live by yeah. Rob Cantor, it's one of the most amazing YouTube. It's like it's a perfect YouTube video. It's like it's like yeah. you know three minutes long. It builds. It has a. It's funny. Anyway, go watch it. It is. But. Peak, peak internet that is yeah. peak internet yeah no, no, Dave, i feel like like i i wanted to talk to you for a little bit but we have so much more i'd love to go over we'll have to get you back at another point but i real quickly i want to talk about uh warner brothers world in abu dhabi so yeah, yeah. you that's the, how did you get involved with that because that is a massive massive accomplishment it's it's so it's a it's an enormous theme park in abu dhabi all indoors and it's it's a, the largest warner brothers theme park out there is that is that what it is or how does that the largest it's the largest indoor theme park in the world. It's uh, 1.4 million square feet, wow. I think. Um, 
um, yeah, I so I got involved with that through uh, Thinkwell, which was the previous company that I worked for for mm-hmm. about almost thirteen years. Um, run by a, a, a creatively run by a friend of mine who I worked for at Universal, Craig Hanna. And so in I had worked at Universal and Men in Black. I worked for Paramount Parks for a while when they ran all the um, what are now Cedar Fair parks around the country, the Kings yeah, Island, yeah. Kings Dominion. So I did attractions for them for a while. And then I left there and was looking for work and ran into Craig at um, IAPA, which is the big convention, International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, which is next week in Orlando, actually. Um, and it's the big, you know, crazy, nerdy convention, carnival convention, of what we do. <laughs> um, and I ran into Craig and he's like, hey, we have this big project. And that was, um, let's see, that was two, November of 2007. Uh, I got hired and started in December and the park opened in uh, uh, summer of 2018. So wow. it was uh, over over ten, over a decade of my life working on that park. That is, so so how far along was it when you came in? Was it just on like on paper at that point? Or? It had a it had a, it had a couple of concepts. Um, it had some really broad ideas. And that park actually went through like three cycles of, of ideation. The, the first one was crazy, crazy Dubai money early in that, in the Middle East money thing. It was three times what we ended up spending. It was crazy. And that, then the bubble burst there, they had a big financial crisis there in 2009. The project got went dormant for about six months and then it came back again and we sort of right-sized it, which is the version you see now. But um, okay. so so the, the version you see now, uh, I was on from literally nothing on paper. Um, uh, and, and it is, uh, all indoors. It is DC comics and Warner brothers, classic animation, which includes, um, Looney Tunes, Hanna-Barbera and Tom and Jerry and, uh, uh, all sorts of family attractions and multimedia attractions and 40 shows and simulator rides and a couple of coasters. And, and I'm really, really proud of it because it was a, a chance for all of us who worked on it really, you know, none of those things had ever been explored in a truly immersive way. They'd been at the six flags parks in, in a sort of rudimentary attraction way. Um, but as far as in a world where you have attractions like, you know, Harry Potter and cars land and where, where you're completely immersed, no one had taken that level of storytelling and environmental immersion to DC comics or Looney Tunes or Hanna-Barbera or anything. And so all of a sudden here's a bunch of, us designers who are all about my age or a little younger who grew up on this stuff Mm -hmm. you know i I learned everything i know about comedy and uh uh, classical music and drag from looney tunes you know what i mean (laughs) like uh, um so uh, you know when that came down the pike it was like oh my god are you serious we really get to play in this and and it was uh it was great is is we it was a really wonderful collaboration with the folks at Warner Brothers Consumer Products are the people who end up being sort of approval folks for everything. And they were great. And so it was 10 years of just giddiness and joy. And, you know, ob- obviously all these projects have their speed bumps and have challenges and have politics. But but the bottom line is every bit of joy we have for those stories and those characters is in that park. And and yeah. and, and that was the most gratifying. I, the, my favorite story about going there was um, uh, on the last day I was making my rounds I'm taking my final pictures and it's the day where you sort of say goodbye. Right. I'm, I'm no longer going to be the most important guy in the room. And so um, I'm walking around the park and it's full of people and it's open. And I see this group of uh, Emirati uh, ladies who probably not twenties, twenties to thirties. And they're all in various forms of abaya and, and the, the traditional dress and head wraps and things. And they're all taking selfies and laughing and, and all of them have bugs, bunny ears on, on top of their abayas. <laughs> And, and it just makes me chuckle. And I walk over and I'm just looking at them smiling. I don't want to take a picture because that would be rude. But they look at me and go, can, would, can you take a picture of us? And I'm like, for sure. So they line up and they're all selfieing with their ears on, you know. And I hand the phone back to her and she looks at it. And I said, I really love your ears. They're really, really adorable. And she looks at me, the most earnest look ever, almost with tears in her eyes, and says, they make me so happy. Oh. <laughs> Man, <that's laughs> and it was beautiful. Yeah, and it was that moment where I'm like, I'm done. This is yours now. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the cherry on top of, of all your work there, right? And that's, that's this perfect. Is yours. I burst into tears and walked out of the building and haven't been back since. 
Oh man. Now, so, I mean, that's got, a, that's such a unique experience of, of being there for the development of literally from dirt to a full blown attraction. I mean, not, not many people get to do that. I mean, no. I guess the team at Epic Universe is, is kind of the, the next big thing, but I mean, really th that doesn't come along a lot. I mean, the nineties, you had kind of this giant, giant spawning of the, you know, the Disney, Disney parks open up everywhere, islands and, and everything opened up, but it feels like now things have kind of slowed down, but now like there's this this these this group of people who are, you know, in their in their 30s to 40s now that grew up yeah. on theme parks and now they yeah. want to do it again. And yeah. I think we're we're I mean, COVID kind of hurt it, but we're definitely on this resurgence of theme parks. And that's honestly kind of why I wanted to start this podcast, because to me, the, this experience like we, we've kind of become so, you know, do everything from home. I'm going to watch stuff on my phone. But have, having that experience of being shoulder to shoulder with one, experiencing a fireworks show, riding a ride, you yeah. can never top that, in my opinion. No. And so, no, no. and I, I think we're we're getting back to that kind of experience, and and I think I think we're going to see more stuff like this, and and that makes me so happy that you got to you got to be there to help craft the whole world under under a yeah. roof. Like that is amazing. Yeah, not I mean, not many people get to say they they built an entire world. You know, and, and, <laughs> and, and I, it's the, I mean, if I never do another theme park attraction or, or, or theme park in my life, I'm, I'm happy. Cause those, cause I did two really pretty amazing ones, men in black and that, yeah. um, you know, and the industry, like obviously COVID did hurt it and hurt the parks. And a, a lot of my friends were laid off for the big players like universal and Disney. I was laid off from think well, um, because those, those, the design part of the industry had to change and had to get smaller and it's going to be smaller for a while. Right. The, mm -hmm. the bad part of COVID is not just that the parks closed. It's that the, 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 um, assembly line of work that creates new capital projects had to shut down. And it's, yeah. and frankly, like I, I, I've told people who are just coming out of school who want to get in this industry, I'm like, new capital projects are not going to be coming back for a while because yeah. all the stuff that's in progress is going to open. And you're going to see a, a resurgence of, you know, Halloween and Christmas and summer and spring break and events and temporary stuff and live shows and parades. That's going to get huge for a number of years because that's what they're going to have to ride on. But like the parks writing a check for another multi-million dollar attraction, I hate to say it, it's going to be about three to five years since that starts up. Everybody keeps saying Epic Universe, Epic Universe. Yes, comma. <laughs> They're only clearing <laughs> land right now, right? Like so, yeah, yeah. So yes, that all is gonna come back. And but but this goes back to what we said earlier about where should I work if I want to get into the theme parks? Go work in one now. Because okay. go go work in stage management, go work in parades, go work in events like Halloween Horror Nights, go work for the vendors that do costumes and parade work and sets for all of those things. Go don't work for work. There's this ecosystem of companies around those parks that are still going to have work. And that's the best place to start. If you want to start right now, because Imagineering is moving to Florida, right? So they're They're going to be in the middle of a big move for a while. That ain't going to happen for a while. Universal's probably a little busier because of, you know, Epic universe and they're hiring again, but, but, but if, strategically within the industry, um, it, things are going to be a little slow. And then there's going to be this massive, massive explosion of it. Because like you said, the kind of entertainment we make is something that, will only have more demand um, as mm. as we sort of get past COVID more and more. Like we ain't out of the woods, of course, but yeah. um, as the parks start to operate and people get comfortable with going out, there's going to be this huge demand for something new. And so you can bet your booby that in like 2020, to let's say I would say 2024, 20, 25, you're going to see some announcement for, all right, new, what's the next, you know, rise of the resistance? What's the next big attraction? You're going to start seeing yeah. that again, but it's going to it's going to be very, very slow burn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm looking forward to it and hopefully you'll be involved in some form or fashion. And we can get you back on the show if we're still doing it in four to five years from now. <laughs> so. I'd, lo I'd love to. This was a lot of fun. I would love to talk to you guys some more, even if it's not about me. If it's just like, hey, let's talk <laughs> about dark rides. Give me your top oh, three, man. you know. I love oh, that. That would be great too, Dave. But I have a feeling you've got a lot more life left to share with us and, and a lot more experiences. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what though? Like I love, even in your sort of nascent experience, one of my favorite things on the planet is to take somebody to Disneyland who's never been. Like yeah. I'm, t well, funny you mentioned tomorrow, I am taking two friends from Seattle who've never been to a Disney park ever. And the oh, only, wow. the only other theme parks they've been to is they went to a, a Six Flags somewhere and they went to Universal with me last time they were here, like six months ago. And, but they've never been to Disney at all. And I am 
beyond myself, beyond getting <laughs> hype. Because my favorite thing is to sort of tee it all up and just watch, yeah. right? Yeah. And and to watch their minds get blown or watch them really love something or watch them try a turkey leg for the first time or whatever, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's great because like, you know, being someone like I've had this experience with Jeff where you can kind of curate his experience, you know, it's like, OK, I know kind of these emotions are going to hit and this sort of attraction is going to go. And it's like it's fun to be able to be there and sort of like, you know, hold someone's hand through their first experiences with it. And so and that, that's gonna, that's gonna be a lot of fun. And it is such a powerful experience, too. Like I've had a tremendous amount of fun with you, Jack, exploring this world. But right before COVID started, February of last year, my girlfriend took me to Disneyland and I had that experience you're talking about i got the button where they said this is my first name my first you know i put my name on it this is my first time and it was such a powerful experience and i i was honestly not that excited about going uh and then i had a moment where i walked into i guess it's fantasy land is that what it's called um that's one of them yeah one of them and i burst into tears Oh. I didn't quite understand why. And I had to I had to I had to say like I need a minute. You guys go ahead and I just sat down on a bench and something about like so much of my childhood came rushing back and it was overwhelming. It was a beautiful moment, and a beautiful experience and I'm still kind of unpacking it honestly because it was a it's a confusing amount of mem- memories kind of overlapping all at once, you know. It takes a while to separate it. But uh yeah, that's a, it's it's uh those those first experiences can be incredibly oh. powerful. Absolutely. And so we need to put it on the calendar next time you guys are in SoCal, Jeff and Jack. We are going to a park. To, we are <laughs> all going to a park to. together. All right. I, all right. Absolutely. absolutely. That sounds 100%. like a blast. We're going to well, hold Dave. To that. Dave, thank you so much for joining us on Annual Pass. If you want to follow Dave, make sure to follow him on Twitter, Dave Cobb, C O B B, two B's. Um, and yeah, anything else you want to you wanna plug or talk about before you leave? I, I know you got secret <laughs> stuff coming up in the future. I'm excited. Hopefully, we'll talk about that at some other time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I do too. It's I'm, I'm working on some really interesting stuff. It's a it is sort of location based, but it's also a bit of a pivot for me. So it's um uh, uh because of COVID, but it is a a very cool thing that I'm very excited to talk about, and I can't say a thing about it. But you clever bunnies <laughs> on the internet can go read our website. You can find the link on my Twitter to where I'm working, and go read the website. And you'll figure it out. <laughs> Beautiful. Awesome. Well, Dave, thank you so much again for joining us. Really do appreciate it. We'll absolutely have to meet up in person, grab a churro or something, and just talk about theme parks. It'll be great. Absolutely. absolutely. I'd love that. Thanks, guys. Wow. That was awesome. That, he, he was very nice to me. So he was very nice to you, Jay. Yeah. So uh, that, that was Dave Cobb. And wow, uh, thank you very much to Dave to coming out and talk to us. And I, I hope we get to talk to him again in the future. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating person. Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool dude. And it was very nice of him to come and hang out with us for a little bit and, and just talk warm about and friendly and, and like obviously incredibly knowledgeable. Yeah. yeah. We, we've been so lucky with some great interviews for yeah. this podcast. And I'm, I'm very excited. Like it seems like everyone kind of in this world in sort of this this realm of, of media and entertainment it's just everyone's friendly like everyone's nice that makes me really happy i'll tell you man i really appreciate it because we uh we don't it hasn't come up in this podcast but 1000 years ago in my uh, previous career i was a journalist in the, yes, in the united states army uh go army and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the slogan right yeah. Yeah. go army. army that's what we say go army. and uh, so i was a journalist for five years and i talked to people and interviewed people for a living but i interviewed people that didn't want to talk to me <laughs> and it's so nice and refreshing every interview we have done in uh it, it, for through the course of annual pass i've just it's been so refreshing to talk to people who would genuinely want to 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 spread their knowledge and their joy of this thing absolutely yeah, yeah. He, he was he was a super super nice guy and uh hey if you want to go follow him on twitter as well he's at dave cobb c-o-b-b uh, over on Twitter, and he he posts awesome stuff. Super nice guy and a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, I, I would love to get if we do a live show somewhere. I'd love to get him out there and just to talk more about things. He seems like someone who would sit down and just ramble on for hours about all kinds of things, and it would be fascinating. We've done an event in Florida, so yeah. the next logical step would be California. I would think. Well, I think you know the next thing, the logical step, would be do a live show where we actually do yeah, a prop, in like do a recording. Yeah, and do it. Yeah, do it in California. We do it in Anaheim, maybe closer to Disneyland or over in Hollywood mm-hmm. next to Universal. Yeah. Maybe Universal because he's. If we do, you know, I, maybe do one in Anaheim. We get Jim Shull out, and we do one in, in Hollywood, and we get Dave out. I think uh, I don't want to tip a hat or get ahead of our skis here, but I do think there is a plan, uh, a tentative plan to do a live show in 2022. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I've heard rumors of things floating around. Nothing cemented a, a, a yet. Possible, but... uh, a possible podcast live shows. So yeah. 
fingers crossed, and you know, feel free to uh, reach out to uh, Rooster Teeth. Let them know you want annual pass live in your backyard. So yeah, or your front yard. <laughs> so now, or your neighbor's yard. <laughs> We're not picky. So this is the point now where I go through our comments over at roosterteeth.com, and I pull down some questions, some Q and A questions that you, the beautiful pass holders, have left for us. Uh, these are questions from the Honey I Shrunk the Audience episode that we did uh, a little while back. Great, great attraction. And so uh, again, I try to you know give you context of where they live. Um, this one from Animation Twins with a Z with a Z at the end. Hey Jack and Jeff, longtime listener since day one. I can't wait until you post the video of you guys building the Lego set. My sister and I haven't done ours, so we can do a build along. Man, Aww. I want to do that too so badly. And yeah. I, I, I feel like I've been harping on it behind the scenes a little bit, but it's because I just I have it in my head that you and I sitting in a table similar to this, although I guess. Uh, before long, we'll be in a different studio. Yeah, yeah, we're about to uh, move. Uh, this is a temp space, and then we're going to move to another temp space, I think, <laughs> yeah. until we get to our final permanent space. Uh, but uh, I just I just think it would be interesting and fun and engaging, and I easily... It's one of the things that I've caught myself doing on YouTube now. I, I watch a couple things on YouTube yeah. when I'm just want, like, going to pass the time. One is I'm really into live cams oh, from yeah. around the world, like especially right now. They'll be like... Like nature cams? Like last stuff? night, I was watching a cam on YouTube of some ski place in Minnesota where people were just, it was really neat. They were, it was like a snowboard track and it was just kids snowboarding. And then when they'd go down the hill, they'd do a jump and go down the hill and they'd grab onto a, a rope that would pull them along back up the hill. And it was just oh, like okay. in this, I watched that for a while. I watched a, a live cam feed from the North pole. Oh. I watched one. Uh, it, I, I was oh, there's for a while there. There were these, there was this uh, national park in i think in alaska that was had live cams of bears oh, as yeah. they're getting ready for bear, bear cams are a big bear thing, cam yeah. huge uh i saw a little bear fall off of a, <laughs> a very small waterfall last night it was <laughs> adorable very fun anyway so i've been doing that a lot but i also have occasionally catch myself just watching people put legos together and okay. it's like kind of soothing nice. you know okay yeah so that's the plan i mean we do uh, uh, uh jennifer and jessica the the twins in florida yeah. so i wonder if animation twins is a different uh, twins um they well uh, they're not animated they are real they we've are met real, them multiple they're real times. humans uh, they gave us the uh, the new mini Magic Kingdom castle set that they released for the the 15th anniversary on October 1st. And so, yeah, the plan is for us to build it and put it on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash annual pass. Here's why I'm excited about that. All the reasons I just said, but also, at some point, we're going to be in our forever space. Well, I yes. shouldn't say forever space. At some point, we're going to be in our space, our, yes. our permanent space. And when that day happens, we can finally set dress. Yes. You know what I mean? We can I... finally have a set, and I cannot wait to have... All of the things that we are going to have to 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 dress the set with, but the least of which is I want to have a wall of all the Lego stuff that we build. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, there we go. We've got so the, uh, I have I have a thing. This has been in my bag. So if you're again, you, you need to watch this on the YouTube channel. But uh, someone gave us a uh, it's it's a picture of Jeff and I as the. Uh, the monkeys from uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey, <laughs> <laughs> and it says, "Enjoy Florida, Jack and Jeff learning about G-force 2021 colorized." <laughs> <And> it's us <laughs> screaming as, as monkeys here from uh, that's from Nico. So this was given to us at a, a the at our meetup actually in Florida. Yeah, and I've had it literally to put on the wall whenever we can actually have a set, a proper set. So uh, yeah, so things like this, I can't wait until we have a, a permanent home for. I was going for uh, Disney Castle, but that <laughs> that one works too. <laughs> well. That was like a piece of fan art. I'm yeah, yeah, no, it's great. It's it's a hilarious. And we'll put Gail Fox's poster up there. We can, uh, we can have a, like a, a permanent place for your golf ball. So I would. Well, I you know I like to use the golf ball throughout the recording. Yeah. I just I just envision like a, a wall of shelving with all these impressive oh, yeah. Lego builds that we've done. And maybe maybe someday we'll do because you know I'm a big puzzle guy. You are. A big but I've been trying guy. to create puzzle content for Rooster Teeth for a while. Maybe someday we'll do that thing. I've never done it where you you uh, you make a puzzle and then you you like shellac it. Yeah, you like glue it, glue it, mm -hmm. and then frame it. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. There's a lot of Disney puzzles, too. Like, they have some really, really I've done cool. one. Yeah, yeah? I've done a Magic Kingdom. Uh, last, I want to say last Christmas or my birthday, Emily got me a Magic Kingdom puzzle that was really fun because it didn't have hard edges. It was, like, the shape of the... Oh, wow. Like, the edges were the, the scalloped kind of shape of the mm -hmm. park. And it was... Oh, dude, I, can, I still have it. Ooh. I also have... She bought me a bunch of these Japanese wood puzzles, and they're all Disney-related. I don't know why. This is years before annual pass. Uh, she, or, she, she didn't buy those. My mom bought me those. Say, maybe she but, was ceding uh, this to you. But yeah, anyway, but there's tons of stuff. Right? There's tons of uh, fun things we could chachki. I can't we could wait. Decorate yeah. with. But please, please subscribe to uh, YouTube.com/slash Annual Pass. Okay, I've got another question for us. This one is from Thorn17. says, I think Jeff would make an amazing scarecrow in a haunted house, just hanging around and scaring the 
crap out of people. So what? did you mention that at some point? I, I don't think, know. I think maybe you were talking about. I don't know. That's a compliment. You, or I mentioned that I'm going to try to work on next year's Halloween Horror Nights, getting you guys into a that's Halloween That's right. House. That's where that came from. That's okay. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You could be a what? scarecrow. Why is a scarecrow specifically? Just, hang on. <laughs> I, I, God, do you think we could do that? Do you think we could go be like guest haunted house, uh, guest scare actors for a night? I would love oh, that. I think so. I think so. I think we do that in Austin at the... Uh, House of Torment, probably. Or, you know, go to Universal and do it at the proper amazing Halloween well, Horror Nights. Yeah. Dude, I could be that beard guy with the the little the puppet beard guy. <laughs> I, would, I would totally do that. Well, you better start growing that beard out. I know. I got to grow it out. It's got to get some time for it. So, uh, Did you, now, have you shaved your beard down for wind resistance? Uh, I was getting long, and also uh, it gets messier as you eat. Yeah, as, you, don't want to sure, carry, you, know. you don't want to carry that extra weight no, when you're not running. No, not at all. Yeah. I got to you know, trim it down. I got my hair cut finally, which is really nice, mm. and got the beard trimmed down as well. So, Okay, now this is where I ask you know, a question of the audience, and I say, hey, here's a question for you. If you answer over on roosterteeth.com in our comment section, uh, then I will randomly pick someone to send a park map autographed by myself and Jeff Ramsey. So uh, the question I had during the the uh, the episode, the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids episode, that, this one, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is uh, what movie do you think deserves a 3D attraction? So, you know, obviously, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids made sense. It worked really well. The the, the ride itself was really great. Someone mentioned, too, that um, now I, I was asking, like, what, what lives in the, the theater that Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Captain EO used to be in. Apparently, it's a Pixar short theater now. You can go and, like, watch Pixar shorts. So that's kind of cool. All right. Roman Heretic says, answer Fantasia, that old Disney movie about music. <laughs> Thank you for qualifying it. <laughs> It had so many cool set pieces from Wizard Mickey to the dinosaurs to Night on Bald Mountain. Can you imagine how all of that can translate to 3D? It would be such a fantastic musical experience. I don't know if it was about music as much as it was about sweeping stuff. Yeah, I think that was, it was, like, it was Sorcerer the, the Mickey. Broom movie. One of the coolest Mickey outfits is that Sorcerer Mickey outfit. Mm. Uh, also, there is a, a show called Philhar Magic. At Magic Kingdom, and I think they include stuff from Fantasia oh. as well. There's a lot of different music stuff in that show. It's 3D as well. Twisted Lazarus says, I'd love to see a How Miyazaki slash Studio Ghibli 3D 4D attraction. Just thinking about all the immersive experiences created in each of Miyazaki's films set the perfect stage for a 3D attraction. I can see the audience being there to watch some uh, some kind of new animation technique through an accident. And they're transported into the artist's world and encounters with Totoro, Howl's Moving Castle, Laputa, and others. It'd be exciting and awe-inspiring at the same time. That, that would that that could be very cool. I uh, I it'd be I, the cat bus. Oh man, my head neat. immediately jumped to like being on like being on the broom with Kiki, Kiki yeah. and like going through and delivering stuff, and then maybe that like morphs into Porco Rosso, and you're like flying fighter uh, pilot planes and stuff. Right, what, and, like what was the ones like the giant robot things? Like uh, it's that Castle in the Sky, I think. Oh, uh, I never saw Castle in the Sky. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. So there is a, a Studio Ghibli theme park opening in 2022. Where at? It's in Japan, yeah, right? In Japan. Well, I guess uh, hashtag uh, Japan will pass. Japan will pass. Hashtag. Get, or hashtag get annual pass, pass to Japan. Has, get, get hashtag annual pass. Annual pa Japan pass. Whatever the long one was. That's the goal. I want to go to Japan. It'd be a lot of fun. Maybe someday. Maybe if you guys buy enough shirts. Have you ever been? <laughs> I've never been to Japan. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, I remember you went to Tokyo, right? And yeah, just for a very brief little. Didn't like, you stay? You stayed at the uh, the Lost in Translation Hotel, didn't no, you? No, it was booked. Oh, Gus has stayed there before. Maybe. I stayed at a similar hotel. Mm. Yeah, I took my daughter, just the two of us, for Thanksgiving a that's, couple years ago. That's so cool. Jimmy King two eleven says, "I would love an Emperor's New Groove." There's so much slapstick humor and physical comedy in that movie; they can easily make it into a 3D experience. It's one of my favorite Disney movies, so would love to see this receive the 3D att attraction. That would be cool. Have you seen *Emperor's New Groove*? Uh, probably David when Spade, it John Goodman. Came out maybe. Oh, so good. I have zero memory of it. It's got uh, uh what's his name, uh, Putty, um, uh, Patrick, Patrick Warburton. Warburton. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great, great film. I could see that could, they could have a lot of fun with that because there's like a whole like roller coaster thing they could do. They could they could have, blow it out of there. Uh, AA Ron twenty one says, uh, I personally I would go with an all time favorite for a show, The Purge. <laughs> Go a little bit in a different direction here. It would probably be a Halloween Horror Nights exclusive. Yeah. But I yeah. can see them having fun with it by possibly hiding scare actors within the audience. Yeah, that could be. Uh, yeah. 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 So, A.A. Ron, not sure about that one, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, last, here's our winner. I randomly picked it, uh, picked from our, everyone who answered. Again, thank you, everyone, over at roosterteeth.com. Go feel free to answer the question I'm going to ask this week. Landrus says, I'd love to see a Wreck-It Ralph get the 3D, 4D treatment. I feel there's some great potential and room for some nostalgia video game factor. That could be great, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, because like even when they go through like the internet, it's like kind of like the warpy tube uh-huh. stuff. Like yeah, on the races, Oof. like you su- you suddenly end up with you know uh, uh, was it Penelope Von Schweetz did you, riding around with her? Did you see Wreck It Ralph two? Yes. Oh my God, is that one of the it wrecked it, Jeff, s- didn't saddest it? <laughs> movies of all time? Yeah, that broke my heart. Oh, yeah. um, it, I, cr- I cried a bunch in that. Movie. I think it definitely hit you a little bit harder about it. Uh, yeah. someone who's <laughs> essentially daughter is growing up and is kind of living her own Moving life on now. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't have a daughter, leaving, so. leaving you behind. Um, <laughs> I I know you're not asking me, but uh, throughout the course of uh, you reading these answers, I have been struck with stark, strong imagery. I don't know why. My answer would be today, uh-huh. Jack. Not that you asked. Would be a 3D, 4D treatment to the claymation uh, stop motion Clash of the Titans. Ooh. I wow, think that would be okay. The old Ray, like the Ray Harryhausen version? Yeah, oh, wow. like 3D, 4D with stop motion, like that kind of stuff. I think it'd be interesting. That'd be really cool. That'd be really fun. Wow. I didn't think about Get that. Harry Hamlin out there to reprise his role. He's still around. <laughs> He's a bit old at this point. Uh, yeah, I think, man... That'd be cool. I think yeah. a Beetlejuice thing would be a lot of fun too. Beetlejuice would be great. Of course, we already did the, we did that we did the house, so it kind of felt like we were walking through it anyway. Yeah. So just turn that into a 3D experience. So thank you again, everyone who who answered that question over on Rooster Teeth. I really, really do appreciate that. And uh, so now today, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, we had Dave Cobb on, so my question for you feels like a little bit behind the scenes. The scenes? Sure, why not? What ride would you ride with the lights on? So like what like what kind of like peel back sort of the facade of kind of like the Space show Mountain. stuff. Space Mountain is terrifying. I've heard it's terrifying it's with the lights on. Very scary with the lights on. Uh, Rock and Roller Coaster was a lot of fun with the lights on too. Uh, because really? that, I mean, you don't know it when you're there at the time, but that's a whole roller coaster in a building, and so it's all just like twisted in mm. on itself, and so you realize like, oh, you're really close at all times. So that'd be a lot of fun. Um, anyway, let me know what you would like to ride with the lights on because I saw uh, the Orlando tourist uh, who is another guy I'll mention in the next episode when we talk about the Men in Black ride. He was on the Men in Black ride when it got evac'd. And they had all the lights on, so it was like him walking around. Oh, so you get to it. see it? That's yeah, so you got cool. to see it. So they, they, They're okay with people filming that, I guess? A lot of times, yeah. Typically, when a ride like evacs to the point where it's like, we have to walk you off this attraction, as long as you're following the cast member or team member, like listening to what they're saying, they'll let you kind of do whatever you want because gotcha. they're like, oh, this is, this is our bad. It was broken. We don't want to make a big deal out of it. I remember when I worked at the Great Movie Ride, when I, the the one time we had an evac stop where a ride vehicle broke and we couldn't move it, so we had to walk everyone back to the entrance. Um, they basically say pretty much let anyone do whatever they want as long as they don't get hurt. Okay. So it was like we had a big John Wayne, That's and cool. like people went and like took photos of John Wayne and stuff. And there's a Clint Eastwood; they were taking photos of Clint Eastwood, and it's like stuff you could never do. But it's mm-hmm. like give them a good experience because they have a broken thing, and we don't want them talking about the broken stuff. So yeah. So anyway, I imagine they pretty much do whatever they want. That's so. great. So, again, what ride would you want to ride with the lights on or experience like that? Let us know at roosterteeth.com, and I'll randomly pick someone. We'll send a, uh, an autographed park map to. And, uh, and just leave us a comment over on Rooster Teeth. I really do appreciate all the comments. It means the world to me. I love reading everything. Please uh, leave more comments. Just let us know if you're enjoying the show. It doesn't have to be a question or a comment. Just, just let us know what's going on and what you, what you think and how you feel about it. And maybe, like, what you'd like to see in the store because uh, we're trying to get more merchandise for 2022. So, uh, But merchandise that you want that yeah, makes sense, not yeah. just like logo slaps man we we uh i i tasked uh tony who's our our art guy at rooster teeth uh who loves <laughs> disney stuff i was like hey man like can we do like an epcot themed annual pass shirt and he's like on it and gave <laughs> us like amazing concepts and they look so good yeah and i'm so happy for it so that'll be coming out sometime next year uh we still got the ponchos like i swear to god we're gonna get ponchos at some point we have some new uh, Ponch- m- more ponchos pins. are harder than you would think. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, because it was a question of like, do we want to do like a cheap, like you know, five dollar poncho, or do we want to do like a premium poncho? And I think we're going more premium. So now we're just trying to figure it all out. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. You guys are seriously the absolute best. The pass holders are incredible and just make me so happy every time I read all your comments. And you're beautiful, and I love each and every one of you. Jeff, you feel like you learned something today? I do. That's good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> I feel like I learned stuff every well, day. Dude, Dave Dave taught us so much. I, I learned that I want to have him back on the show. Uh, yeah, that's the first thing I learned yeah, is that yeah. Dave Cobb is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's it. Thank you very much, everyone out there. Uh, this comes out, I want to say this comes out around Christmas. Actually, Christmas is in two days. So if you celebrate Christmas, uh, happy, happy Christmas to you. And uh, stay safe out there. Eat lots of food. Enjoy your time. And we'll talk to you soon. Love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.